about that was interesting. Um, again, I was talking to my friends in America um, about stuff, I guess you could say. Um, I'm really happy actually that I've actually managed to make, finally make a pen pal friend that is more like a real time friend instead of just um, you know emails and crap and it just fizzles out and turns into nothing after a certain amount of time. Finally, and to my relief, they are male. Not because they're superior, because they're not, but because we have a lot in common. And, well, I am not going to mention the other stuff, but um, I'm sure you can guess, maybe. So, yeah, one of the reasons why I have headphones on is, like, it helps me sort of, like, focus. Um, I'm just basically listening to old school type bands. Because why not? Yeah, when I went to India, um, I got these in um, Mumbai airport, and this was really cool. Now the thing is, this guy, or this thing, this elephant, I'm not sure how to pronounce elephant with an Indian accent, but I mean on the side, it, it looks pretty cool. Like, I think so anyway. Um, like even cute. Like on one side it looks like more cute than on the other side. But the problem is when you look at the elephant directly, you just realize that it's basically just derp. I mean, look at it. It's it's bloody derp. Its face. I mean, its eyes are misaligned, and I find that rather um concerning and disturbing, I guess you could say. It's not very nice. <laughs> so, yeah, this is pretty cool because the elephant is blue and I love the colour blue. Bluey, green, or just blue in general. Um, I know this design looks pretty cool. I did hesitate getting souvenirs because I was so dead when I was in India. I just wanted to I don't want to say I just wanted to leave, but it's kind of getting to that. <clears throat> and uh, this little guy thing, maybe it's female because like it's got a mini elephant inside it. This was interesting. It's like a wooden carving. I wonder if it's made out of sandalwood. It's um like a specific kind of wood. I don't know. It just smells like a particular smell of um yeah. It just has a particular smell. Which I find cute. I thought it was like a baby elephant. And you can see the carvings. One thing I cannot fathom is there is a baby elephant within the elephant. They managed to carve a mini elephant inside the elephant. You see what I mean? I mean, just look at it. It's crazy. Wait, I think so anyway. Um, yeah, trying to get a good shot. Yeah, can you see that? I think that's an eye. Mm. I can just get the all to a line, you would be able to better see. So somehow, they managed to carve this inside this, which is crazy. Like how, like just, how is that even possible? I just, um, I don't even know. Anyway, that's pretty cool. So, um, I can imagine though, it's probably not really nice when it gets um, dusty. I'm not really sure what to do with these because they don't have any names, and this is just derp. Derp. Like, the meme. I mean, who. Or what the hell would look at this? Like so misaligned. It's just ridiculous. Oh. Anyway. So um these are elephants, not bonks, as one friend thought. I was playing with a bonk. This 
is an elephant, not um, a bomb. So, whilst I'm just casually massaging elephants into my face, I'm trying to remember what I was trying to talk about before I got interrupted. And I'm not complaining. Uh, meeting, well, FaceTiming these interesting people through a friend. I basically experienced being in a bar in Boston uh, at 2 a.m. That was pretty cool. Um, it's just exactly how I'd imagined it, you see. Because I didn't even have to go there. It, it looked like somebody's living room. Which I found pretty cool. I can imagine a lot of hipsters attending such places. I would just love to basically be able to go to a bar and talk someone's ear off, I guess. Maybe not talk someone's ear off. I, I like I like hearing people's crazy stories. So um, sometimes I just ask all kinds of crazy questions and I just listen to people. Which is what I usually do by default. I just keep the conversation going. I'm, I'm not going to start blabbering on about my personal views or political views unless I'm looking for a verbal fight. Um, and that's quite rare, to be honest. But when it does happen, I don't like actually creating wars. I like creating an illusion that uh, I have a problem, and then t taking it back and like, no, I don't have a problem. Um, I like this is no fight. <laughs> we're, we're cool, man. <laughs> so, like, no, no political fighting turned into uh, some kind of weird fight necessary. Although, I do feel that if I was a guy, I probably would have been beaten up by now multiple times. Which is not really good, because I've been threatened not so much at a bar, um, in certain circumstances for refusing to play along with certain um, men's ideas of being polite. Like, I'm not rude. Um, just one time I refused to shake some druggy looking uh, rednecky type, chavy, 40 plus year old man, I don't know, some crazy guy, he just came up to me and said I was, I don't know, made some comments about how I looked sexy or whistled, and I just tried to ignore it, except they followed, well, they kind of followed me, and then they started trying to talk to me, and that was during a day as well, and then they demanded, at one point this guy was demanding I shake his hand, I was like, no. He could be like my dad's age, like, just no, <laughs> just, um, and I, I even said like, no, why should I shake your hands, like, I don't know you, uh, and then they got really aggressive because I said, no, I don't want to shake your hand, uh, just being stupid, and then they said, oh, kick the fuck out of you, that was really crazy, actually, uh, they wanted to beat me up, basically, just, uh, luckily, where this happened was right near a CCTV camera. I was about to basically threaten, look, there's a CCTV camera, if you try anything, um, it will be recorded and you don't want to deal with this drama and this is just, you know, just pointless escalation. I didn't have to get to that point, but they just started yelling at me and I kind of just walked off awkwardly. That was rather strange. So when it comes to bars and pubs, i uh, never had any problems specifically I've dealt with people who are just like basically offended by me having any opinion that's not about shoving my tits in their face, which is rather annoying because, um, I don't know, maybe if I did humour like some random guy in a pub or bar, like maybe I'd get free drinks, maybe if I just learned to play along and play dumb, that's what Marilyn Monroe did, didn't she? And I'm starting to feel like I understand people's frustrations, well, people like that. I'm starting to understand why there's just no point even opening up to people and talking um, about how you feel stigmatised or, I don't know, attacked, I'm not, I don't want to say attacked, but you know, pushed into a box corner because, um, yeah. 
because you're not playing along with the social norm of conformity. And I don't even mean like acting like a troll and being a social justice warrior. I mean just simply have like if if you're a female and you know more about football than a guy, um, that's grounds for problems. For instance, um, if you're more into politics than a guy, that's grounds for arguments. Um, yeah. It's just really silly, I find. Um, basically trying to prove you have more balls than a guy with balls is a problem, I've noticed. Um, and I'm in no way a lesbian, at least. I don't think so. And to be more specific, I don't think I'm trans, because why would- I mean, let's say I was. I'd be way too lazy to change, get a sex change, go through all that hell and genital mutilation just, just to fit into a box. And then maybe what if I just decide, ah, oh, I'm just a gay guy anyway. Hmm, no thanks. That's not what I want. At the end of the day, it's easy as a woman to basically dress tomboyish or more like a guy than it is for a guy to dress like a woman. At least for a good long time it has been that way. Only maybe very recently some guys are wearing clothes that would be considered rather feminine. And no one's questioning it anymore. I guess you could call that being metrosexual, potentially. Uh, I don't really care because, I mean, like in the Middle East, you wear like robes and stuff like that. And in Southeast Asia, you also, the men, the men also wear robes. So who gives a crap? Because in the past, the only people who wore tights were men. Men in tights. It's just not practical though, I suppose, if you're a man wearing a dress in a modern day and age, you know. Um, because that's weird if you're doing that to pick up girls, for instance, wearing a dress as a strange man. That'd be very strange. Although it could be used as a prop, being so eccentric, they actually draw a lot of attention. But, uh, why not become a drag queen then? Hmm. I was meant to read parts of a book and, or box maybe, at least to practice. Um, <sighs> I'm actually starting to get like tired of men. To be honest, when I say men, I mean the society in general, and because I find as people age, they start to become more gender segregated, and by gender segregated, I mean they play up more their roles, maybe because they're burnt out, they're jaded, they're exhausted. So a man and a woman, can they just be friends? I don't think so. And not only that, um, it just which makes it immensely hard um, if your interests are all like male dominated. Um, I do have like interests, like I'm interested in things like women like would be interested in as well, but that's such a generalization because not all women are interested in the same things. Yet I don't know many women interested in physics or philosophy, um, and I kind of wish there was. That would be really nice, but like, do they exist? I don't know. Like, how's that? Like, how does that make a woman masculine if she's interested in science? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, as long as you don't look like some, like old girl or something. But if you do choose to look like that, that's more than my beeswax. I don't really care what you look like. Well, I do in terms of like, don't be hideous and stuff because you know it's. It's nice to look and feel nice. Why would you want to look horrible? That is a rather strong coffee. Um, I'm not sure it's really working. I'm really supposed to get through the rest of this book. The 
Ike's David Ike book. The Perception, Deception, or oh, it's all bollocks. Yes, all of it. That's what I like about David Ike because, um, like, I don't know, he, <clears throat> he's aware that he sounds insane, basically, but, um, he doesn't actually bring up anything that would be seen as, in my personal opinion, delusional or not based off anything at all. Um, and why my fixation on um, science or evidence or proof of something, like proof of aliens or proof of uh, the impossible, because why not, you know? Um, I get like this kind of stuff doesn't interest most people. Um, I wish people, more people, be interested in this kind of stuff. You know, I don't even mean David Icke. I mean all these kinds of books or conspiracies. I just wish people would ask why. Like, if you don't ask why, why are you even on this goddamn planet? Okay, if you know how to enjoy the pleasures of life, that's fine. But as uh, what's the name of that movie? Dorian Gray and. Like, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but something like, um, I don't know. Okay. Interesting that somebody wrote an article. The conflict between aestheticism, oh, I can never say that word right, and morality in Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Um, the Battle of Good and Evil in the Picture of Dorian Gray. I should have probably googled this more often, but the quote something about pleasure is quite different from happiness or something like that. In other words, yeah, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. In fact, if you never, if you've not experienced much pleasure in life, that's kind of depressing. I reckon. Maybe I need more pleasure in my life overall to slow down and just appreciate things. But um, I don't know. Happiness. Happiness is important. And, um, for me to be happy, I mean, I could be happy off simple things, I suppose. You know, even... But I don't think I'd feel fulfilled if I did not have a sense of meaning. And for me to be truly happy, I need to have meaning, basically. Or I need to create my own meaning. Otherwise, like, what's the point? We're just, like, living in pure, random chaos nihilistic hell, like, it's just, you know, just, I don't understand why people enjoy being so ignorant. It really bothers me, actually. I think I would have been interested in this kind of stuff since age eight anyway. Okay, maybe not this book specifically, but for instance, um, this, I don't have it right now, but this book, um, or books in general, by the author Graham Hancock, I love his stuff. Why? Because I remember my parents recorded um, these movies on VHS off TV, and they—I don't know if they'd intentionally done that—but they ended up recording the doc a documentary uh, that Graham Hancock, like a whole series he'd done in the 90s, maybe like 90s or early 2000s. He might have been late 90s, and I was really, really young, and I was just. I don't know what was wrong with me, but I was just like fascinated by watching the, these documentaries, like, you know, just with Graham Hancock in it, over and over and over again, like in a loop, on VHS. And I thought, like, this is not normal, I'm I'm supposed to be watching, like, freaking Disney movies, which I did, but I had, I needed more, basically. Um, I just, I wasn't satisfied at all. And I was really happy when you had um, Google Video, iGoogle, and or um, and YouTube. Uh, they put up these documentaries, and I was even more happy when I found out that he had all these books. And I was even more happy that he had interviews. Well, 
not with, uh, I'm not sure with David Icke, but <laughs> interesting enough, one of my other favorite, I guess you'd call them conspiracy journalists or writers, basically, uh, is uh, David Wilcock. He had an interview with Graham Hancock, which I found absolutely hilarious because I'm both obsessed about those personalities. They both had an interest in journalism and they both are authors. And they, I wouldn't say they look alike, but I know they've got this like similar energy of like they're just obsessed about um, connecting all the dots to completely unrelated things, like even David Icke. Um, and I don't know, this. I don't know what I'd do without this stuff. Like, if 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 just like no David Icke and no Graham Hancock and no David Wilcock, what would I do? Maybe I'd maybe somebody like me. I feel like maybe I would take over. I probably would like pick up all the pieces and I I would try and connect seemingly unrelated news stories uh, to each other, which is what I've done before in the past. Um, trying to connect the stuff on the military history, alternative history. Um, connect um, mythology um, to, say, UFOs, and religion to the more um, fringe topics such as, again, UFOs or aliens. Mm. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the point of this is. I just I don't know. I find it quite annoying. I guess what I was trying to say a bit earlier is why are the women doing this? Not this specifically. Why I'm doing? It. I mean, why are the women like where are the female equivalents? Of doing this? Where are the female equivalents of writing philosophy books? Where are the female equivalents of doing this? Where are the female equivalents of making this? I don't know, like, I'm just using uh, these random examples. They don't have to, but it would be um, a bit nicer if they're like... I don't know if there's been more of a balance, but maybe, maybe like topics such as philosophy or conspiracy theories or journalism or playing instruments is a masculine thing, well if that's the case then it's a feminine thing. Like, we're not here anymore to just like give birth, like we already have 7 billion people on this goddamn planet. How many more kids does a planet need, you know? Like, I... If just our population thing is real, we need to be taking care of the kids already like being born now, rather than just like throwing them away and stuff like that and was like, you know, producing another child, leaving a legacy, producing another child, leaving a legacy and and there's no I don't know, just no development. Um and history repeats itself. And right now I feel like society, Western society, is suffering from a breakdown of the traditional family values, I guess you could say. Um I mean maybe it might evolve into something different interesting. I don't know about good though, so who knows. Let's see if... I, I don't know really. Um, I can't remember what I was going to do anymore now. As in talk about. Hmm. <laughs> A uh, random page about the moon is not a balloon, but blah blah. Huh. That's just weird, actually. I was just I was mentioning like a quote that was mentioned by the character Dorian Gray, which is written by Scott Wilde, and that's, that had nothing to do with anything, right? And then, coincidentally, I'm, I just like flick to a random chapter, or just David Icke, but really thick, right? Uh, about the moon, I presume. And then there's an Oscar Wilde quote. 
<laughs> like complete, not even related to like Dorian Gray or anything. It's just like random. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> Why is this guy so special? Um, I might as well read the quote, which says, "Yes, I am a dreamer. For a dreamer is one who can only find his way by moonlight, and his punishment is that he sees the dawn for the rest of the world." Yep, sounds like being a pioneer of society. People basically laugh at you and rip you to pieces and don't believe you. And when it starts happening to the rest of society, you know, bad things or what, the, collectively people realise things, you're just an idiot. Like, I guess like the character, like, um, the scientist character, or Jeff Goldblum's character in Independence Day, where he says, like, He's, I can't remember because I haven't watched the film in years in in, um, in in the movie Independence Day where one of the quotes it's not even a quote but there's an implication I can't remember that Jeff Goldblum's character who plays a scientist I think or journalist he's basically just this guy who's going I told you so that's what it feels like he can sense his like frustration like nobody believes him nobody takes him seriously and he's just going insane because nobody takes him seriously until it's essentially too late. He knows too much, basically. And I love that character since I was maybe... Well, the movie came out, I don't know, when I was like six, seven years old. And I watched Independence Day over and over again for like several years. So <laughs> I was like pretty obsessed about the character. Because I kind of... Oh, I could relate, I guess. God forbid if you're female and you're like predicting things or I don't want to say predicting things but you're just talking about things that people haven't realised yet like the economy crashing um, everything falling to pieces and you're just wording it from your own impressional experiences about the way you feel and everyone's just looking at you like as this expression I made up which is I call it the uh, fluoride dead stare gaze yeah Fluoride dead staircase. Fluoride dead. Something like that, yeah. Because their eyes, I have seen people's eyes just like sort of like glaze over over the kinds of things I've said. I'll admit, like, yeah, I've said some ridiculous things. And it's annoying because I've usually said things with intent to help people, not like, I wouldn't just like, just stop like rambling about random crap because I didn't even know any of this crap. I didn't know about David Icke when I was in like high school, but. Um, I was obsessed about um, getting to the bottom of things, basically. Um, <sighs> Interesting. Maybe it's actually totally boring, but um, a random page from this chapter. Maybe I should read it. Um, under this title, it's a spacecraft. All these apparent mysteries and anomalies can be explained if, as I strongly suggest, the moon is a gigantic construct, like a Death Star, um, possibly a hollowed out planetoid, or just as possibly, I don't know why it's written like this, a click, click, enter within, am I reading this right? Anyway, a click, click, enter within the virtual reality of universe. It is important to keep in mind that in a virtual reality situation, anything can be inserted into the game, and we are talking about an interactive game in which holographic information of compatible frequencies would be decoded as physical and could be walked upon lived in and changed around. I say that the moon functions inside a computer and receiver transmitter system that amplifies the Saturn transmissions specifically for the Earth. This is not the only way the moon can be used or has ever been used. I suggest that it has been hijacked by the Archontic Conspiracy and is in the process of being taken aback for the benefit of humanity. Nor am I alone in suggesting that the moon is a construct.
That was rather awkward, because even with headphones on, I heard a neighbour walk past the the flat, and that was pretty awkward. Because I don't want them to hear me talking about crazy person shit, basically, which I do frequently. Often, it like I will say things, or read out things, or repeat things that are completely inappropriate and get me into massive trouble. Not necessarily that a neighbour would care at such an early hour. But yeah, I might as well continue anyway. Because um, I just want to get to this part. I don't know why, really. Why not? I gave it I've written so many books. Like what? Like 10, 20? What crazy? Anyway. Right. Where was I? Um... Blah blah, moon functions the computer, frequency... Oh yeah, a quantic conspiracy and is in the process of being taken back for the benefit of humanity. Uh, did I read the, the entire sentence? Nor am I alone in suggesting that the moon is a construct of some kind. There are authors of Who Built the Moon, for stars. And then there is... Mikhail Vasin and Alexander Shebil <laughs> Bakov, two members of the Soviet Academy of Sciences who wrote a detailed article in the Soviet Sputnik magazine of in 1970, I'm just going to read real fast over the boring bits, uh, called Is the Moon the Creation of the of Alien Intelligence? Their conclusion was that the moon is a hollowed out planetoid and this fits with the moon being inside out in terms of extremely hard lunar surface. Yeah, I once like I have to pause my own reading. I once basically read there was like a study that apparently the moon made a sound of a gong when they tried to I don't know like re record sound of the moon or they fired a laser at it. I'm not entirely sure, but if you google that there are multiple um stories of the moon sounding like a gong and making it sound like it would like echo basically into space um, which may prove that it was basically like hollow which kind of fits in with these theories being suggested I'm like really gassy because I keep eating things that make me gassy anyway uh, blah, blah, blah. Soviet scientists said that the moon is controlled from inside, where a large civilization could have lived since the hollowing out process. Zulu legends about the moon say that it was hollowed out by two brothers, Wawane and mm, I, mm, mm, Panku, and the leaders of the reptilian Chitahuri. This is the same theme found in Sumerian tablets, which describe how two brothers, Enlil and Enki, were leaders of the Anunnaki Zulu account, say that Wawane and... I can't say that... Manku <laughs> stole the moon from the great fire dragon in the form of an egg, and hollowed out the yolk. The symbolism of the moon as an egg was common in the ancient world, which is true because a lot of mythology kind of refers to the moon as an egg, which is interesting. Does that mean the moon is like, what, pear-shaped? Egg-shaped originally? I don't know why they referred to it as an egg. I suppose sometimes it looks like the colour of an egg, maybe. Oh well. Um... The Babylonian goddess queen Semiramis of Ishtar was said to have come from the moon in a giant moon egg and landed in the Euphrates River. This later became known as Ishtar's Easter's egg. Ishtar, uh, in brackets, it says Easter's egg. And here we have the origin of Easter eggs today. Well, it doesn't surprise me that pretty much every... Um, Catholic uh, ceremony or Christian ceremony um, has been known to be seen as technically pagan. 
there's theories that Catholicism isn't really Catholic because like the Vikings sort of infiltrated it with their own um, paganism um, apparently so a lot of it's like fertility goddess symbolism or phallic symbolism or the um, Vesica Pisces, Pisces um, symbol which is like two ovals with an intersection which pretty much represents like uh, a vagina basically or the womb um, or the fish the fish precisely that genius now so oh. I mean this is like based off like stuff I've researched or read and grown up with as well um, stuff that you're not really you would have been burnt at the stake for saying even suggesting because he'd be called a satanist or an insane person um, bringing such things up when in reality uh, the church Catholic Church and Vatican do conceal a lot of shady shit such as um, apparently there's this new thing where um, they've been trying to conceal or at least they revealed more recently that the Vatican has evidence that there were female priestesses but this just reminds me of ancient Greece. I don't know why. It would make a lot of sense, actually. Um, but then it sounds rather pagan, doesn't it? I'm wondering if I should keep on reading. Maybe I should. Scientists connected to NASA have also wondered if the moon is hollow. Dr. Gordon MacDonald. Do they like MacDonalds? A NASA scientist said in the 1960s that it would seem the moon is more like a hollow well there's a NASA scientist saying this um, that the moon is more like a hollow than a homo homogeneous sphere and Dr. Sh uh, Sean C. Solomon of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology MIT uh, conceded that um, the evidence pointed to the frightening possibility that the moon might be hollow. Yep, just as I was saying, I haven't even read this stuff, so I already know this stuff. This is crazy. Um, acclaimed cosmologist Carl Sagan, who wrote the book Dragons of Eden, uh, about the effects of reptilian genetics on human behaviour, um, said that a natural satellite cannot be a hollow object. Uh, NASA scientists struck the moon with a blow equivalent to one ton of TNT after seismometers. Uh, no, seismono. Oh, I can't even say the word. Seismometers had been installed, and they said that the moon rang like a bell. Yes, it's like everything I just said. It's been. I haven't even read this. I haven't even read this part of the book anyway. Like I'm probably like flicked random pages. I, how do I know this? I don't know. Maybe I just watched too many YouTube videos. So read too many books. Um, yeah. I don't know why I'm getting so excited, but I already know this stuff. But it's just basically a confirmation of everything I just said right now. <laughs> I hadn't even read this part. Um, yeah, so it's not a laser they used, it's TNT they used to blast the moon. Um, the moon rang like a bell. Maurice Ewing, a co-director of the seismic experiment, said that he could not explain this. It is as though someone had struck a bell, say, in the belfry of a church, a single blow, and found that the reverberation from it continued for 30 minutes, he said. 30 minutes? So oh, that's a lot of echoing. Um, Dr. Frank Press found that the reverberation from it continued for 30 minutes. Oh, wait, I just read that sentence. Uh, I should sleep. I tend to reread the same sentence, like, it's very annoying. Um, okay, Dr. Frank Press from MIT said it was be quite beyond the range of our experience for such a small impact to produce this result. The moon was later struck with a current of 11 tons of TNT, and that scientists said the moon reacted like a gun. <laughs> uh, that's not what I just said. Um, the vibrations continue for three hours and 20 minutes to a depth of 25 miles. Ken Johnson, a supervisor of the Data and Photos Control Department during the Apollo mission, said that the moon not only rang like a bell, but the whole moon wobbled. 
so precisely that it was almost as though it had a gigantic hydraulic damper of struts inside it, I guess some technology to balance it. When a uh, meteor hit the moon in 1972 with a equipment of 200 tons of TNT, the shockwave surged into the interior, but none came back. Well, <laughs> that's kind of weird and creepy, like a sort of like shock absorber. Uh, they seem to love giving the moon a good smack, and you can bet that when they bombed the moon in 2009, it was not to see if it had water, as NASA claimed. They also announced in 2010 on the NASA website, after analysis of images from the lunar reconnaissance, reconnaissance orbiter LRO spacecrafts, that the... Uh, the moon was shrinking at that newly discovered cliffs in a lunar crust indicate the moon shrank globally in a ge geologically recent past and that might be still shrinking today. Wait, so the moon's shrinking. Um, uh, scientists have long been bewildered by the unusual nature and behaviour of lunar soil and in 2012 saw scientist Marek Zubik at the Queensland University of Technology discovered nanoparticles in the lunar soil in, inside bubbles of glass. We were really surprised at what we found, Dr. Zbik said. Instead of gas or vapor inside the bubbles, which we would expect to find in such bubbles on Earth, the lunar glass bubbles were filled with a highly porous network of alien-looking glassy particles that span the bubble's interior. Hmm. We already had all these coincidences, mysteries and anomalies surrounding the moon. Uh, and then they find that it has nanoparticles in the soil with extraordinary properties. This gives support uh, to the Soviet scientist who said that in 1970 the moon was some sort of artificial construct. So even the Soviet scientists thought it was like weird. Um, and it's the Russians that sent the first man on the moon, not America. I think they even sent a monkey on the moon as well. First monkey. They said that the moon had been hollowed out to create a home for potentially a considerable civilization inside, and this explained the metallic rocky slag. Rocky slag. Every time I read the word slag, I just like kind of just I don't know. on the lunar surface and the uranium two three two three six and neptunium two three seven. Okay, I guess that's the number for it. Given that the nuclear technology was like to have been evolved, it would further solve the mystery of the areas of the size of Texas covered with melted rock containing titanium and chromium and zirconium. Human body is the uh, chromium, by the way, to prevent diabetes, also to prevent things like acne, and to regulate your blood sugar levels. So if you crave sugar, completely a different subject, if you crave sugar and you're a fat bastard, or you're a skinny hypoglycemic idiot, uh, chromium, you need chromium basically, if you're always hypo, hypoglycemic, how you pronounce that. So yeah, chromium. It's good stuff. It's good for your pancreas. The human body needs probably like over 57 different minerals anyway, which is a totally unrelated topic to the moon. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, never mind that. Now that it's going into detail, basically several pages of the... the boring bits, I guess you could say. Boring because, like... Um, oh, although now they're starting to talk about Prometheus on this page. Oh. The Saturn badge in Prometheus. Oh, it's the robot guy in the movie Prometheus. I wonder if it will show. This guy, I thought he was cool. It's a shame he got, like, beheaded. Spoiler alert. Not that anyone gives a shit. So, uh, yeah. This guy, oh. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm already bored. The Freemasonic compass symbol can be seen in the ancient sigil of Saturn. I'm guessing they mean medieval times. Yep, Freemasons, Judaism. The symbolism behind it is basically Saturnian. 
with so a lot of Roman festivals. And the original celebration of Christmas, which was originally called Saturnalia. Some people theorise Saturn was our second sun, or it used to be a sun, and it's actually some collapse kind of sun. Just another theory, but yeah. I I'm open to every possibility when it comes to anything at all. I feel like I've kind of bored myself to bits talking about that, to be honest. As fascinating as it may be, because, well, um, I don't know why I'm even bothering to read this stuff. But I just thought it was funny that the reference to the moon being an egg and the moon sounding like a gong again. It's just crazy. Like, I, I know this stuff already. What do I do with this knowledge? Like, I wish, like, basically I could just get paid to basically talk about stuff. That would be so cool. Um, I think so anyway. So, I'm wondering if I should, like, read, um, this guy's crappy stuff. Uh, The Drug and Other Stories, Alistair Crowley, edited with an introduction of blah blah, who gives a shit. Uh, this volume brings together the uncollected short fiction of poet, writer, and religious philosopher Alistair Crowley, 1875 to 1947. Crowley was a successful critic, editor, and author of fiction from 1908 to 1922, and his short stories are long overdue for discovery. Of the 49 stories in the present volume, only 30 were published in his, in his lifetime. Most of the rest appear to be here for the first time. I guess that's one of the reasons why I got it, because, I don't know, it just seemed rare. This book costs nothing as well, like, uh, from Waterstones' this bookstore. Um, two or three pounds basically. It's like no one wants this stuff. Um like the their author Crowley's stories are fun, smart, witty, thought provoking and sometimes unsettling. Yeah, I I don't know. The guy's pretty unsettling. So <laughs> there are certain places in which he had lived and knew well. Uh Billy Puck, uh uh Paris and Edward Edwardian London pre revolutionary Russia and America during the First World War. Hmm. The title story, The Drug, stands as one of the first accounts, if not the first, of a psychedelic experience. His black and silver is a knowing early noir discovery that anticipates an entire genre. Atlantis is a masterpiece of a court fantasy, a dark satire that can stand with Samuel Butler's ear or one of how we pronounce it, it's stuff. Frank Harris is considered the testament of Magdalene Blair, the most terrifying tale ever written. Scary. I'm actually, to be honest, maybe it's a rather bad idea. Like, uh, I once, like, I, I knew he, like, um, like, talked about chaos magic, or sex magic. Um, communicated with this being called Lamb that that was essentially a grey alien, in my personal opinion. I don't know. He just seems kind of like full of himself because every time I've tried to read this stuff, it just sounds like it's just mental masturbation. He's just like, it's just his id vomited all over all over these pages of him going insane so he's kind of essentially full of himself and it wouldn't be so bad if he seemed like an like a nice charming person another random person walked by and that was rather awkward so i hope they didn't hear me like say the word mental masturbation way too loudly but anyway i'll just read the forward a bit of it the end of it. Crowley used his short stories as a medium of entertainment, but wrote both himself and his evolving belief system into them on many levels. As with all of his writing, one way of looking at these tales is as manifestations of continual autobiography. The stories thus resonate on several levels, from that of pure entertainment to those of self-promotion and occult instruction. The author was uh, no stranger to problems with censorship. Uh, one can 
well imagine that if his collection, this collection, had been published during his lifetime, it would have been damned by the yellow press. The collapse of the moral and political order of the hypocritical imperium of Christian Christendom was one of its enthusiastically sought, and in foreseeing this and so much else that is manifest in the world around us and its masks, he was a prophet. Is the is this the first instance of a god in the making for Crowley with Fanny to say about himself, as God goes, I go, writing short stories? It's time to reassess these witty, strange, and occasionally very dark works as the rare and lovely jewels they are. By some random guy called David Tibet. Who the hell's called Tibet? That makes no even sense. Hmm. He embraced the romantics and emulated them in his early poetry after brief flirtation with aestheticism, and then embraced the decadence and symbolists. Along with Balzac and Verlaine, Baudelaire was a major literary influence, almost a lifetime preoccupation. Like most Europeans at the time, he was probably introduced to the writings of Poe by Baudelaire. His French was very good, beginning in 1902. He occasionally lived in Paris, and he translated Baudelaire, Verlaine, and Balzac's friend, the magician uh, Il Elifas, uh, Levi, I can't pronounce that. Anyway. Through his translations, criticism, and occult writings, he imported symbolist sensibilities to England and America in all but name La. 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 I'm just like already bored. His early attraction to magic, Buddhism, and yoga evolved into a lifelong preoccupation of true, of, of uh, with the true nature of the self and its transcendence. And what a self to transcend! This book is just like kind of like worshiping the guy. It's crazy. It's weird because. This guy kind of actually reminds me of another guy in real life, flirting with Buddhism and yoga and yeah, magic and the idea of transcendence. It's all very well familiar, actually. Um, yeah. Oh well. It just seems kind of pretentious because I'm from another time, so it's hard for me to relate. He rides a horse with beautiful wings like a swan, or sometimes strange, a strange creature like a lion or a bull, with a woman's face and breasts, and she has unfathomable eyes. My fairy prince is a dark boy, very comely. I think everyone must love him, and yet everyone is afraid. This is very weird. <laughs> I don't know. Just reading random pages. My fairy prince. Well, this guy, like, straight. Like, he probably, like, had sex with everything, to be honest. People like that. I don't know. Um, this is like actually so boring me. Like I don't even care anymore. This book's so crap. I know if I got rid of this book, trying to replace it actually might be hard because I'll just like forget the name of it. It's maybe one of those books I need to have in PDF format. Uh, I don't know if it's meant to be a philosophy book, but it's in French, and I haven't managed to speak French in ages, and it seems fairly normal, which would make sense. I could read the back of it. Uh, yeah, Jean-Paul Sartre, la nausée, donc j'étais tout à l'heure au jardin public, la racine du marronnier s'enfonçait dans la terre, juste au-dessus de mon banc. 
je, je ne me rappelais plus que c'était une racine. Les mots, c'était s'évanouir et avec eux, la signification des choses, leur mode d'emploi. Les faibles repères que les hommes ont tracés à leur surface. J'étais assis à peu voûté, la tête basse, seul en face de cette masse noire et noueuse entièrement brute et qui me faisait peur. Et puis j'ai eu cette illumination. The hard to speak. Euh, ça m'a coupé le souffle jamais avant. Ce dernier jour, je n'avais pressenti ce que voulait dire exister. Basically, just some guy again existential sitting on a bench. That's basically what I was talking about. Sitting in a public garden talking about roots. I'm starting to wonder if, like, all French people were by default miserable, and all, like, French writers were all existentialists, and, like, also... Um, this stuff seems kind of easy to read, but this would be pointless anyway reading this because obviously I'm not going to translate. Um, but I really should read something in French, uh, but maybe it, but it has to be good, like it can't just be crap. Or it won't keep my attention at all. I will get so bored so easily, so fast. I wonder, I used to always like feel bad, it's like I can't read Harry Potter in French, it's just, it's just wrong on so many levels because direct translations into another language when it was not made for that language just sounds, it, it doesn't sound right, generally. I don't know, maybe I'm just being a bit snob, but my brain could not like process Bailey Harry Potter in French, I had to read it in English, and um, yeah, it's just been weird. Like, if something comes out, like in cinemas, or like a book or something, and it's English, like, why would I watch all this to it in French? But I have done such things, um, and uh, it doesn't feel quite right. Kind of like opening Christmas presents before Christmas. That just, like, sucks. So yeah, I don't, I can't believe I just basically sat down like reading out loud this rubbish. Um, cause I, I, this is like rather boring. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily by default boring. Just, I need to think of things to do. And I'm still waiting for the universe to provide me a nice HD camera. And technically I do have one, but I can't use that camera. This is rather annoying. And yeah, just I wonder if I can get any apps on this. I still have yet to figure out how to um record uh, like game type stuff directly into a computer and it seems near to impossible if it's a small handheld device. And would I really care Nians? Probably not. But I've played so many games it's just I wish I yeah I wish I could have like sort of recorded some of the like uh, I don't know just level ups stuff like that. I even have an app on this to actually watch anime, which is not bad at all. It's such a shame. Like, this device is quite good, I think. But, um... 
think nobody talked about it really and it's quite powerful. The device is just nobody's really making games for it. And I find it extremely annoying because they removed uh, Kingdom Hearts off the latest they removed it off the PlayStation store and it's the only way you can get it for the PS Vita because the older one uses um, I'm not sure but disc type things maybe and the new one doesn't and they don't sell it in stores the actual you cannot buy the game and so I find it extremely frustrating that my favorite game I anticipate on playing on this device I can't even play because apparently Square Enix had an argument with yeah just um, the place PlayStation basically, you know, it's just well, Sony to be correct. And as a result, no more Kingdom Hearts. It's rather frustrating. I should have just got an older model if I knew it would be that bad. Or even just like bought a Game Boy with the original um well the Game Boy version of the game. If I wanted the uh PlayStation version of the game. There's multiple versions of this game and I'm just like obsessed about it. I mean I have it on PlayStation two or three. It's not so bad. I haven't really yet played it properly. I'm not I don't feel like I can just like pick up the game and just play for hours without feeling guilty. Because I need to I need to live in reality, like I can't just read from books and play games. I need, I basically need a job. I need to make a living. I need to get out of this like rut, basically. Otherwise, um, I don't know how I can sort of like maintain just like existing.